Lord, you have been our refuge from one generation to another. Amen. God does not die on the day when we cease to believe in a personal deity, but we die on the day when our lives cease to be illumined by the steady radiance renewed daily of a wonder, the source of which is beyond all reason. Doug Hammarskjöld, the second secretary general of the United Nations, wrote these words in a diary that was found after his death in a plane crash in Africa in the 1960s. Who is God? Who is the one who gives us time? How do we come closer to the holy and radiant one? How do we approach the source of our gratitude? After Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem with the crowds yelling Hosanna and waving palm branches and leaving their clothes on the ground to welcome him into the city. After Jesus casts out the money changers in the temple. After Jesus takes up residence in the temple, healing and teaching. The authorities of his time plotted to entrap Jesus in his own words. And so they seek to test him. And they ask him, Which of the 613 commandments is the most important? And Jesus quotes Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your might. He goes on to quote Leviticus chapter 19, verse 8, saying, The second commandment is like the first one. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. When I was a five-year-old on a Saturday morning, the neighborhood kids convinced me on some pretext, I can't even remember what it was, to ring my neighbor's doorbell. They knew that he worked the night shift and that he was asleep. And so he came down, his face was red, and the veins in his neck were sticking out, and he swore at me like there was no tomorrow. Many of us have had experiences like this. And so when we hear the word commandment, that's what we think, that we're going to be punished for something that we have done wrong. But Jesus has something very different in mind. Jesus hopes to let God direct us, direct us toward joy. God loves in freedom, not by forcing or compelling us as a dictator might, but God helps us to be what we were created to be. The context of the readings that Jesus gives us is part of his message. In Deuteronomy, it says to love God and to teach your children and your grandchildren to love God because that is how we will thrive. Quote, that is how, quote, your days may be long, end quote. The context of the second commandment in Leviticus shows us what it means to love your neighbor. It gives examples like When you harvest your fields, leave some of the food in the fields so that the poor can can have something to eat. When you owe money to a laborer, pay him back right away. Don't, Don't wait another day. Let your word be your bond. Speak the truth. Make commitments that you stand behind. Care for the disabled people. That is how Leviticus describes loving your neighbor. Now, in our daily life, we will meet many people who, like us, believe in the golden rule that you should treat others as you want to be treated yourself. But there are not so many people who you'll meet who believe that the first and great commandment is to love God with all our heart. And that is why each of us needs to be prepared, to be ready, to be a witness, to be able to answer the simple question, why God? Why should God come first? And what does the love of God really look like? One of the reasons why we need to keep God first is because of the problem of idolatry. We are creatures that require meaning as much as we require food and shelter and rest. Meaning is at the heart of our life together. 
And when we really connect with people, we're sharing that sense of meaning. This week I met with two new staff members at Grace Cathedral, and we talked about our life story. That story doesn't exist just inside of me or inside of all the people that I know or all the people alive. It exists in God also. And idolatry, idol worship, is when we take something that should be of minor importance and we make it our whole life. We treat something that is not God as if it is our God. And all of us have seen examples of it, and all of us do it. We treat obvious things like money, our reputation, our career, our pleasure, as if that were our God. But we do this also for other things too. We can take something as good as a mother's love for her child, and we, if that becomes the sole principle of governing our life, can make a kind of hell for the people around us. The 20th century author C.S. Lewis wrote a book about heaven and hell called The Great Divorce. In it, you open the first page and there's this massive gray city that's constantly at dusk. It's run down and it's empty and it's raining constantly. And the people who inhabit the place are, are almost like shadows. They're, they're not completely real. And so they, they line up at a bus stop and they get on a bus and it takes them up into the outskirts of heaven. And there, everything is so beautiful. There, there's grass and flowers and trees, and the sky is so blue. And these people who are, who are almost unreal, they're almost like ghosts, are confronted with what is real. And the people they meet are real too. One of the characters in the book is a woman who loved her son so much that she devoted her entire life to him. And she is met by one of her relatives, and she's clearly disappointed that it's not her son who's greeting her. And the relative tries to explain to her how important it is to be able to love something first that's not, that's not her son. The relative says, she said, the woman says to the relative, you wouldn't say that if you were a mother. She says, how could anyone love their son more than I did? And the relative tries to explain to her, you exist as Michael's mother only because you first exist as God's creature. That relation is older and closer. So the person who's gathering, guiding the narrator, says in the end that there are two kinds of people. There are those to whom God says, thy will be done, and there are those who say, thy will be done. Without the real God in our life, we have a terrible tendency to make our own gods. The 20th century theologian Karl Barth writes that the illusion that we can disillusion ourselves is the greatest of all illusions. We talk is if there's some steady place where we are capable of really understanding God and we sit in judgment of God as if we can act in a detached or neutral way. But to use Barth's words, we cannot master God. We cannot get behind God. We cannot grasp God because God grasps us. The nature of God is not an abstract question. The answer to it will completely determine how you live, what you do with every one of your days from now on. How we understand God makes a demand on how we must live. And so this is not an abstract question for the philosophy shop. It's not defining words like omnipotence or omniscience or talking about hypothetical cases. It's about you and me and how we long for the real God who can help us and who loves us. Part of the reason we can't love adequately without God is because God is the one who shows us how to love. And Jesus walks with us and shows us his way. As I said earlier, we're not compelled by God. God does not force us to love him because that would no longer be love. Karl Barth writes, God directs us with hints and advice, not with rules and commands. 
Quote, it is not a loud and stern and foreign thing, but the quiet and gentle and intimate awakening of children in the Father's house to life in that house. And so we are people who are becoming awake to God. And as people of faith, we realize that we are never fully isolated in the world. There is so much that we say that we may forget. There's so many experiences that we have that are gone and lost to us, but they are in God. We may suffer the cruelty of injustice and unfairness, but God is still with us nearer to us than we are to ourselves, and we can seek him out. There is a story about a child of a Hasidic rabbi who used to go out and wander in the forest, and one day his father said to him, what are you doing? And the boy said, I go to the forest to find God. The kindly rabbi said, well, that's wonderful but you don't need to go to the forest to find God. Don't you know that God is the same everywhere? And the boy answered, God is, but I'm not. So where is that place? What is the time when you can encounter God? Prayer is something that we learn, something that we grow into over time. It's something that becomes more powerful in us. A little seed at our birth becomes a great oak through the time of our life. In his book, The Diary of a Country Priest, Georges Balanos writes about this. It's a long quote, but it's, it's worth it. The usual notion of prayer is so absurd. How can those who know nothing about it who pray little or not at all, dare to speak frivolously about prayer. If it were really what they suppose, a kind of chatter, the dialogue of a madman with his shadow, or even less, a vain and superstitious sort of petition to be given the good things of the world, how could innumerable people find comfort until their dying day in the sheer, robust, vigorous, abundant joy of prayer. Could a sane man set himself up as a judge of music because he has sometimes touched the keyboard with the tips of his fingers? One of my favorite parts of C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce, is when the ghost of the boy's mother keeps trying to prove to the angel, the one who greeted her, how he is wrong, that her case is different, that she really loves her son more than God does. And the angel just laughs at her, and he says, we all here in this place realize that we are all wrong. Albert Einstein said that there are two ways of experiencing reality, as if everything is a miracle or as if nothing is. We are all wrong when it comes to God. But this week, let your life be a miracle. Reach out to the one who is closer to you than you are to yourself. Let us try to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. Amen.